International Video Projects presents Travel Florida, your video guide to our state and national parks. Hi, I'm Ranger Larry Gavani with the Florida Park Service. On this tape, you'll see a cross-section of Florida state and national parks. Some of these parks contain areas of rare natural beauty and ecological significance. Others recall the compelling events in the history of our state and nation. In deciding how to tell you about these parks, we knew that we couldn't just list them from one end of the state to the other. Nature and history don't work that way, and neither could we. Our story will take us up and down and across the state several times. So we don't get lost, a locator map will appear on the screen each time we mention a park. And on each map, you'll find a distance from that park to the nearest large city. At the end of the tape, you'll learn how to request more information on the parks from state and federal officials. And now, let's begin our video journey through Florida's fascinating state and national parks. Here in subtropical Florida, the Sunshine State, a rich natural and cultural heritage is being preserved for future generations. Working together toward this goal are officials of the Florida Department of Natural Resources and the United States Department of the Interior. They are helping unique ecosystems survive. They are protecting rare and endangered wildlife. And they are restoring and interpreting many of Florida's most important historic sites. In all, about 10% of Florida has been set aside for state and federal parklands, preserves, and recreation areas. Florida's largest single park is Everglades National Park. It covers more square miles than the state of Delaware. At the heart of the Everglades, Sawgrass grows in the bed of a freshwater river 70 miles wide and seven inches deep. Alligators, great white herons, vultures, and a multitude of other birds and animals inhabit this watery expanse. Here, the largest and the smallest creatures coexist in an intricate web of life. You can see that there's still some moisture left here. It's still very soft and moist. So that algae helps to preserve the moisture here during the dry season. It even produces oxygen, and that's the fish breathe in the water. So this does a lot. You can change this algae, and you can change that grass out there, that sawgrass, by adding polluted waters here. That sawgrass is replaced by a pollution-tolerant plant called cattails. Question to you, what do alligators eat? Raccoons and the alligator, when it's small, over half of its diet comes from this. What do you think apple snails eat? Mosquitoes. The algae, right here. That's right. So the clean water helps these animals to feed. Where the river of grass meets Florida Bay and the Gulf of Mexico stands a vast mangrove forest. Mangroves also thrive at DeSoto National Memorial in Bradenton. We've got four different types of mangroves here in the park, and three we have right here handy. 
This particular one that I've got a hold of right here is the red mangrove. It typically has a longer kind of leathery leaf and it also the most distinguishing feature is the fact that the root system stands up like you were standing on fingers and that's the dead giveaway for that one. It also puts down little shoots as you see these coming down they will go down to the ground and attach and uh, form a good root system in there. The other mangrove we have right here is the white. You can see that the barks are a little different, the leaves are a little different. This particular one has a small leaf. There's a little nodule right down here along the stem that you can see and that's a dead giveaway for the white. You can always tell the white from that. Now right across the trail here we have the, the black mangrove. The dead giveaway is the underside of the leaf. If you look at the underside of the leaf for the black, it's got this light color. I always remember it by telling myself, and this sounds crazy, but I just say to myself, black is white, and I can remember it that way. There's one other uh, mangrove that we have in the park, and I'm not sure that we've got an example right here, but it's called the buttonwood or common mangrove. And that's uh, the one that people always talk about using for smoking fish and what have you. Florida has more than 1,000 miles of beaches. The state and federal governments own many of these beaches, on both the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts. In much of North Florida, spectacular sand dunes rise behind the beaches. These dunes are at St. Andrews State Recreation Area in the Panhandle near Panama City. Often you'll find sea oats growing on the dunes. Please don't pick them. Florida law protects sea oats because their long roots help to anchor the sand and build new soil. Elsewhere in North Florida, dense forests hug the edges of placid bays. Tomoka State Park is such a place. Here you can cycle down an uncrowded country road and picnic in a tranquil grove. In Tomoka State Park's sheltered estuaries and lagoons, tidal channels wind among hammocks of a salt marsh grass called Spartina. It's an ideal place to fish from a boat or from a bridge, and you can even catch blue crabs. But the most marvelous thing of all about Tomoka State Park is the chance to see wild manatees swim up to a dock and drink fresh water from a hose. <laughs> In South Florida and the Keys, North America's only living coral reef system attracts scuba divers by the thousands. Of the 52 different species of corals in the Atlantic Reef System, you'll find 40 species in John Pennycamp Coral Reef State Park. But Pennycamp Park isn't just for divers. The visitor center on Key Largo includes an aquarium with sponges, starfish, and shellfish. In a huge central tank, Florida spiny lobsters cavort with angelfish and stingrays. Other tanks house coral, fish, and plants, typical of the park's reefs, grass flats, and mangrove swamps. The neatest thing I think about our state parks, or being a park ranger here, is at least if you want to see what Florida used to look like 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, when our parents were coming here, state parks are the place to go, because it's our theme is the real Florida. It was the first park of its kind, underwater park, first underwater park in the continent of the United States. And since that time, there's been a lot more concern about the offshore areas and the coral reefs and more knowledge has been gained about you know, how important the coral reefs are, how important the mangrove estuaries and the turtle grass areas that lead out to them, the coral reefs. In addition, about two thirds of all the food and game fish that are found out on the coral reefs have their beginnings somewhere up in the mangrove estuaries. So it is really the basis of the food chain. In addition, it, you know, it is filtering out the sediments that would kill out the coral reefs. You got to think of the corals, the coral reefs as uh, two types of, of areas. You got to think of them as living animals, you know, that are 
very fragile and very dependent on us to take care of them as far as the filtering and keeping pollutants and et cetera from destroy, destroying them. But they're also, as a whole ecosystem, you have to think of them as a habitat too. Penny Camp's northern boundary is the southern boundary of Biscayne National Park. I've been diving the Keys for 20 years and there's reef in Biscayne National Park that's as good or better than anything else in the rest of the Florida Keys, which is why I came here after running for 20 years in the rest of the Keys. And it's all controlled. Uh, uh, the uh, National Park Service uh, strictly limits uh, the activity here. And uh, so the reefs are in great shape and they'll be preserved that way. And we're only 45 minutes from downtown Miami. Most of Biscayne's reefs are circular patch reefs, huge mounds of coral growing in 30 feet of water. Because they rise to within four or five feet of the surface, snorkelers can enjoy them with ease. Biscayne National Park's reefs are 10 miles offshore. If you don't own your own boat, a concessionaire will take you there on a glass bottom tour boat. Even if you don't dive or snorkel, you can peer down through the glass to see the reefs and the colorful fish which swim in the surrounding waters. These hard corals only grow at a rate of a half an inch a year. So it takes about 25 years to get a foot and you can see there's more than a foot of coral on most of these heads. So there, most of them are at least 50 to 100 years old to 1,000 here below us right now. Elsewhere in the Keys, at Long Key State Recreation Area, you'll find convenient snorkeling in the shallow grass flats just offshore. Long Key also has a boardwalk and a canoe trail through a tidal lagoon where you'll see herons, egrets, and other water birds. You can camp at Long Key and also at Bahia Honda State Recreation Area near an abandoned bridge built for the railroad and later used for the overseas highway. On a nature trail at Bahia Honda, you'll find species of West Indian plants which grow nowhere else in the United States. In the center of the state, at almost 200 major springs, fresh water gushes to the surface from porous layers of underground limestone rock. State parks surround a number of these springs. In Itchituckney Spring State Park near Fort White, a crystal clear artesian spring gives rise to the Itchituckney River. All along the river's six-mile course, additional springs boil up from its limestone bed. This park is popular with tubers and rafters. On summer days, you can beat the heat at Wikaiwa State Park, north of Orlando. Swim in the springs where the water is always refreshingly cold. Then rent a canoe and paddle down the Wikaiwa River in the shade of giant cypress trees. You can also swim in the 70 degree waters of Wakulla Spring near Tallahassee. This is one of Florida's largest springs, discharging more than 20 million gallons of water a day. Downstream from the spring, tour boats explore the Wakulla River. Your ranger guide will point out the state park's abundant wildlife. This is a good place to see alligators up close, but not too close. For many people, birds are the main attraction at Wakulla Springs State Park. Two kinds of vultures and nine species of herons and egrets live along the river. The anhinga, or water turkey, swims underwater to catch fish, then perches on a branch in the sun and hangs its wings out to dry. 
The limpkin is one of the rarest and shyest birds at Wakulla Springs. You may spot one perched in a tree or prowling the riverbank in search of the apple snails on which it feeds. A different kind of wildlife experience awaits you at Homo Sassa Springs Wildlife Park. In this spring, manatees live. The gentle manatees can grow to a length of 13 feet and can weigh a ton and a half. You'll see them at close range through the heavy plate glass windows of a 168-ton observatory floating in the 55-foot deep spring. Keeping the manatees company, are 34 kinds of freshwater and saltwater fishes, including popular sport fishing species such as snook, tarpon, and redfish. In Suwannee River State Park near Live Oak, the Withlacoochee River flows into the Suwannee. Springs bubble from the banks of both rivers. A rustic overlook gives you a sweeping view of the rivers and their densely forested banks. Wildlife also flourishes at Mayaka River State Park, east of Sarasota. A ride on the Gator Gal tour boat will give you a good look at alligators and at birds such as these vultures and this little blue heron. Mayaka River State Park is a popular spot for boating and fishing. On the uplands, the main park road winds through hammocks of majestic live oak trees. The long graybeards hanging from their outstretched limbs are Spanish moss. In contrast to the wilderness parks, the Alfred B. McClay State Gardens, north of Tallahassee, is a well-manicured estate. It has a rich diversity of flowering trees and shrubs, including azaleas, camellias, dogwoods, redwoods, and more than 160 other kinds of flowering plants. The park's floral display changes constantly through the winter and spring months. Another man-made attraction based upon nature is a typical North Florida cave, which you can visit without getting dirty or lost. It's in the Florida Museum of Natural History on the University of Florida campus in Gainesville. The museum's cave contains stalactites and stalagmites, fossil crabs and shells, the jawbone of a 10,000-year-old mastodon, and the backbone of an ancient whale. Elsewhere in the museum, the skeleton of a saber-toothed tiger nine million years old is on display. The Natural History Museum also has a discovery room where children enjoy peering into drawers to find shells, fossils, bird nests, and small stuffed animals. Also in the Gainesville area, don't miss the wild sandhill cranes at Payne's Prairie State Preserve. The prairie is a vast marsh surrounded by upland woods where wild turkeys dwell. A visitor center portrays the preserve's history. Famous people who visited the prairie include Chief Osceola, the great Seminole Indian warrior, and the 18th century naturalist, William Bartram. You can also camp at Payne's Prairie State Preserve. In fact, more than 40 of Florida state parks have campgrounds where you can pitch a tent or park a recreational vehicle in the woods with all the comforts of home. Park rangers maintain this living history encampment on the grounds of DeSoto National Memorial. As they keep the camp in order, these soldiers explain their equipment and lifestyle to visitors from the late 20th century. So you had to be careful that you didn't lose a finger in there. Also had to be careful that you didn't point at your friend uh, or the audience. But it was fired by virtue of putting your thumb over the top this is called the trigger in our language, in modern technology, but they called it a cat's tail. Doesn't it look like a cat's tail? Mm -hmm. That's what they called it, a cat's tail. You rested this 
on your shoulder or you can hold it out in front of you, depending upon the size of it and your strength. Then you slide it over your thumb and down to the tip of the arrow. And if you used it several times, actually, you don't have to be the swiftest person in the world to be able to fire this. I'm not putting Pam down. <laughs> but you can see that you can hit a target uh, pretty easy. It's very accurate. So place the bolt, point the crossbow downrange. The bolt is fletched so that we have a flat surface. Kentucky Ridge. We won't have rabbits do tonight, but we sure will have these carpets. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. That was very good. This time, She's going to put that in the serpentine and try it to make sure it goes down into the pan and stays hot at all times. And I have to give you this warning. That if you have hearing aids, if you have small children or you have sensitive ears, you might want to cover them. It's not a loud bang, but it's a bang enough that would hurt your ears if you are sensitive. And the next command when she was ready was, get fire. Shoulder your musket. Marching with your musket, carry the rest. You can see these commands. If you don't find the soldiers in camp, they're probably off hunting. Oh well, you can still visit the museum to see their weapons and armor on display. Then stroll the boardwalk through the mangroves to an overlook along the Manatee River where you'll often find pelicans feeding. Don't leave without strolling down this grassy bank to gaze out over the water. Imagine that you are DeSoto and that you've just landed here to explore the new world. Indeed, you may be standing on the very spot where he came ashore. This monument commemorates DeSoto's arrival in Florida. It also marks the start of the DeSoto Trail, which extends the length of Florida and beyond. History also comes alive in St. Augustine at the Castillo de San Marcos National Monument. It's the oldest masonry fort in the United States. To the delight of visitors, local volunteers portray Spanish guardsmen serving at the Castillo in the early 1700s. also tried to colonize Florida. In the 1560s, they landed on the banks of the St. Johns River, 10 miles east of present-day Jacksonville. Today, at Fort Caroline National Memorial, you can see a replica of the French fort and learn about its defeat at the hands of Spain. Fort Pickens on Santa Rosa Island was completed in 1834. It remained in Union hands during the Civil War, blocking the entrance to Pensacola Harbor. In 1886, the Apache Indian chief Geronimo and his followers were imprisoned here. Today, Fort Pickens is part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore. You can explore the fort and enjoy superb fishing and swimming nearby. Fort Zachary Taylor in Key West is really two forts in one, a fort of red brick from the Civil War era and a concrete structure poured atop much of the brickwork during the Spanish-American War. A museum inside the fort illustrates the various guns and ammunition used there. Fort Zachary Taylor State Historic Site also includes a swimming beach and a shaded picnic area. As you might expect, the capital city of Tallahassee is rich in museums which depict the state's history. After the new high-rise Capitol building opened in 1977, the old Capitol building was restored to its appearance in 1902. Today, the old Capitol is a museum with exhibits that trace Florida's tumultuous political history. The Museum of Florida History surveys the state's heritage from prehistoric times to the present, with artifacts as diverse as the skeleton of a giant mastodon, an Indian's wooden dugout canoe, 
the coat of a Civil War officer and a turpentine still. The state's official art museum in Sarasota was built by circus magnate John Ringling. It contains a collection of enormous paintings by the famed Flemish painter Peter Paul Rubens. The museum also displays other European masterpieces from the 14th to 18th centuries. These vividly covered tiles on the Columbia restaurant in Tampa's Ybor City reflect a vibrant Hispanic heritage. From the 1880s to the 1930s, Cuban immigrants made Ybor City the cigar-making capital of the world. Their story is told in the Ybor City State Museum, housed in the former Ferlita Bakery Building. A tranquil garden beside the museum surrounds a bust of Ybor City's founder and namesake, Don Vincente Martinez Ybor. Way down upon the Suwannee River, near the town of White Springs, this Carillon Tower and the exhibits inside it honor the memory of composer Stephen Collins Foster. Although he never set foot in Florida, Foster wrote Old Folks at Home, which became Florida's official state song 72 years after his death. The Carillon plays Foster's music. It stands on the grounds of the Stephen Foster State Folk Culture Center. And so we conclude our celebration of Florida's natural beauty and rich fabric of history. We hope you've enjoyed this video tour of Florida State and National Parks and that you will now explore and experience for yourself the subtropical wonders of the Sunshine State. This program was produced and licensed by International Video Projects Incorporated of Lakeland, Florida. For additional information about this program and other programs we offer, Please write International Video Projects, 6700 South Florida Avenue, Suite 28, Lakeland, Florida, 33813-3312, or call toll-free, 800-852-0662. Our collection of programs may also be reviewed on our website, www.videoprojects.tv. Thanks for watching.